Okay, so uh, let us recall that we were discussing the importance of or the optimum optimization of pre emphasis de emphasis filtering in the general context. We are not specifically referring to the um, FM systems or angle modulation systems, although they are most predominantly used in angle modulation systems. However, the basic theory that we are doing for baseband systems can be more or less easily carried to the case of FM systems with some simple modifications which we will probably have not time to, no time to discuss. So let us complete the discussion that we were carrying out yesterday and you may recollect that we had come to a stage where we had written the expression for the output SNR as equal to you know uh, we have a, a block diagram that we are looking at it consists of three blocks the transmitter pre emphasis filter followed by the channel which also adds noise channel has some transfer function at C omega and at the receiver we have a de emphasis filter and we were looking at the signal to noise ratio at the output of the de emphasis filter and the expression that we had obtained for the output signal to noise ratio was this. I think this is the point at which we had left yesterday. Is that okay? And our problem that we want to solve is we want to choose a set of a pair of filters pre emphasis filters and de emphasis filters. We want to choose a pair of these a combination of these two. Of course, we know that this combination satisfies a certain constraint. What is the constraint? That the product of all these three transfer functions should be a constant right H p omega H c omega and H t omega right. But within that constraint we want to choose these two filters so as to maximize the output signal to noise ratio right. Keeping there is another constraint keeping the transmitted power a fixed value to be a fixed value so it is a constant. Right. So, as I said in general solution of such problems is carried out through uh, using the calculus of variations right. But for this case it is easy to solve this problem by making use of a very simple well known inequality in uh, mathematics called the Schwarz inequality. And the name is Schwarz inequality does not matter I will just give it to you now. So, to do that what we do is we slightly rewrite this expression. I multiply and divide this expression with the transmitted power S sub t right. So, this will become g square S sub t which is a constant value of course into S sub omega t omega right divided by. So, I have this uh, denominator which I had earlier. And instead of writing S of t as a second term, let me substitute for S of t. What was S of t? Integral of S m omega into H p a omega mod square d omega, right. So, I get this into this. This is nothing but S t, the transmitted power is the signal is the power of the signal which is coming out of the pre emphasis filter. The input of the pre emphasis filter has a power spectral density function S m omega right. So, the power spectral density at the output will be S m omega times H p omega mod square and the area under the power spectral density at the output is the total power that you are transmitting right. The spec power spectrum is given by this product and the total power that is being transmitted is the area under this power spectral density is it okay. All of you with all of you with me on this. So we want to maximize this, keeping S T constant, right? Now to do that, uh, if we we can uh, suppose we keep the numerator fixed, 
because mu theta is if you see really g square is a constant s sub t in any case you are keeping fixed right s sub omega is a cost it is a property of the signal right so there is not much to uh, it does not depend on h p omega h t omega at all in, in literally because you are keeping, keeping s t anyway constant right in that sense. However, so uh, therefore what we can do is we can maximize this quantity by minimizing the denominator right in some sense but let me come I think let us do not jump to any conclusions we will just see what that what that means. To do that once again there is a very famous inequality called the Schwarz inequality which we use to find out uh, what is the minimum value of this product. Uh, the, we can say this product will always be greater than a certain number right and it will achieve its minimum value this product will achieve a minimum value under certain conditions right that inequality tells us under what conditions that will happen right it is called the Schwarz inequality let me take a fresh page. this is what it states these two integrals s m omega mod h p omega square d omega into s m omega mod h d omega actually ideally speaking I should have been using different dummy variables to avoid the confusion right you could do that if you wish if I am using omega here you could use omega prime here but it does not matter as long as you know the context this should not be a problem. This product will always be greater than or equal to the mod square of this integral. What, what do you, uh, in this new integral I take the square root of both these terms that square root of the term here the square root of the term here and multiply the two. So, this becomes S n omega S n omega square root of that into H p omega H d omega modulus of that right d omega and take the square of the modulus of this integral this is what the Schwarz inequality states that is if I have two integrals like this which are being multiplied their product will always be greater than the value of this single integral whose uh, whose integrand is basically the square root uh, uh, the multi multiplication of the square roots of these two integrands modulus square of this integral okay. So, the modulus square of this integral will always be less than or equal to if you separate them out into these two integrals that is Schwarz inequality and this house is, is not a complete statement of the inequality the complete statement is that this inequality sign will become an equality sign these two will become equal under certain conditions right and that condition is that these two these two qualities that we are using in the two integrals they are more or less the same except for a scaling factor. If they, are in, if, if they are scale version of each other then this becomes an equality right. So, equality holds if this is some constant times I am calling the constant or uh, denoting the constant by k square the other term other argument integral s n omega into h t omega mod square. I am sure you had occasion to use Schwarz inequality somewhere or the other in your maths courses because it is often keeps, uh, keeps arising often in many applications. So, it is not so anything new really new for you ok. So, th that is a condition under which this product is equal to this. So, what does it mean that means when this condition is satisfied this product will have the least possible value which will be equal to this value is not it if this condition is not satisfied this product will be always greater than um, 
the number on the right hand side and the smallest value of this product is the right hand side and that smallest value will be achieved under this condition okay. So that really solves our optimization problem. You are solving this optimization problem you are trying to maximize this and in the process we know that the maximizing condition is basically given by this right. This ratio will be maximum when this denominator is minimum, this denominator will be minimum when this condition is satisfied and that specifies our requirement. Is that okay? So now you can solve for HP omega. Um, to do that, you you will also need this condition that HP omega into HC omega into HD omega modulus square is equal to G square, right? This was a constraint that we have on these filters. So if you uh, look at these two equations together and solve for HP omega, you can express you know you want to eliminate HD omega solve only for HP omega, right. So you can do that using these two equations and if very easy it is to check that your optimum value of HP omega up to a function the PFSS filter should have a transfer function which is equal to g k times square root of S n omega upon S m omega upon mod of H c omega. Basically using this, these two equations I am eliminating H t omega and solving for H p omega right that is very easy because you substitute for H t omega square from here right you will get H p omega the, this entire expression will be in terms of H p omega mod square which you, which you can then solve for H p omega. Actually H p omega will come in the denominator it will become to the power 4 and then you take the square root of that and that is why you get finally this mm -hmm. expression. I have skipped one or two steps very simple algebraic steps <coughs> yes please. So this seems to be damaging the right? <coughs> Why is it dimensionally incorrect? G is the dimension of uh, mod of H omega, H omega. No, I think it is okay. Do not worry about this. You can you can check it out and you can discuss it later. This is fine. G has a dimension of H q right this is a ratio right so you will be left with H more of H square right that is fine dimensional it is fine I think there is nothing wrong. Similarly if you solve for H d omega eliminate H p omega from these two conditions these two equations you can solve for H d omega and that turns out to be G by k into S n omega upon S n omega upon mod of H c omega all right and you can also find out what will be the corresponding maximum value of the S n r by using that condition I, am, I will not write that expression but you can write it down right as an exercise. write the corresponding expression <coughs> for the maximum value of the SNR that is when this condition is satisfied right that is very trivial. So I will just skip that moment okay I think I will end this discussion by looking at, at the physical significance of what these filters are doing okay. So this is what the optimum pre emphasis filter should be like this is what the optimum de emphasis filter should be like and if you look at these expressions carefully uh, they will make a lot of intuitive sense 
assume for our discussion that h c omega the channel transfer function is, is an ideal transfer function right that is over the bandwidth of interest this magnitude is equal to some constant let us say equal to 1 right. So, this goes outside out of our consideration from for this discussion right. So, what are we saying that the p emphasis filter should have a transfer function magnitude square which is proportional to the ratio of noise power spectrum to the signal power spectrum right. So, what does it mean that means I must emphasize basically this this magnitude this transfer function will have large values at those frequencies <coughs> where the signal is relatively small is not it signal power is small compared to the noise power right. Remember noise is going to be added later in the channel pre emphasis being done at the transmitter. So, knowing that the noise has certain distribution at certain frequencies which is significantly high I must prepare the signal ready the signal to take care of that I must enhance the signal fre uh, those frequencies where I can expect the noise to be large. So, that I do not uh, have a poor signal to noise ratio even under in, uh, in that situation. So, I must, I must boost up those frequencies at the transmitter where I expect a large amount of noise energy to be present that part of the spectrum should be emphasized that is what the pre emphasis filter will try to do. So, the optimum pre emphasis filter has to do this. Similarly, at the receiver I must do the other way round right. The de emphasis filter is proportional to the ratio of the message spectrum power spectrum to the noise power spectrum right. We want to suppress the noise spectrum. <coughs> Right. So, wherever the signal to noise ratio is good whichever portion of the spectrum you put more weightage to that portion of the spectrum. Wherever the signal to noise ratio is good anyway you have lost some signal because of the poor SMR you give less weightage to that portion of the spectrum right. So, you emphasize uh, so rather de-emphasize the portion of the spectrum where the signal to noise ratio is poor right. And because the constraint is satisfied you will ensure that there is no distortion. Right, because the product of the three transfer functions is equal to 1. So, there will be no distortion <coughs> right. So, this is what the physical picture is. So, so before the preemptive filter I have no idea about the noise which is going to be added afterwards. So, you have to have some idea if you want to do the optimum design you have to have some idea. For example, you may even the fact even the noise that is white Gaussian noise is also, is also helpful right. What is white Gaussian noise you know what it is what it is. <coughs> And if it is one Gaussian, if you know what it is, you can optimize further, right? You have to have some idea in order to use this theory, right? And there are ways of finding it out. So the physical significance I'll just summarize, and then we'll move on. So let's say H H P omega will boost <coughs> frequency components where the signal is weak <coughs> uh, with compared with noise. Right? And release the suppress those where the signal is strong. H d omega will do the other way around it does the opposite ok. But remember that the signal remains unchanged <coughs> because you are both H p omega and H d omega are together designed in such a manner that the product of the three transfer functions is constant right ok. Any questions we will move on. Now, although I have carried out this discussion for the case of baseband systems only, extending this discussion to both AM as well as FM is possible. For AM, it is almost trivial because all you are doing in AM is changing the frequency band. So, your filters, if you want, you can make these filters as band pass filters wherever required, <coughs> right? Or you can still keep the filters at the base band at the uh, both transmitter and the receiver 
because uh, you, you have done the demodulation in the process and you, you have brought the signal back to the expand. So, because the AM only carries out a frequency translation, the theory really does not change at all. <coughs> theory remains the same except for some very minor detail about uh, where the, which filters are, you know, the channel will be a bandpass channel here, right. But other than that fact, nothing else really changes, right. For the FM, things are a little more complicated but it, it turns out that by giving very simple arguments you more or less can reduce yourself to the same solution, right. So, I will not go into those details, I like to <coughs> leave that as, as a self reading exercise, right, how to extend these ideas to the case of AM and FM, primarily they remain the same. But for FM they are this, this concept of de-emphasis and de-emphasis filtering is particularly important in view of the fact that uh, we already discussed when we discussed in the, in the context of tonal interference for example, right we discuss it in more detail and in view of the fact that this threshold is likely to be there. So, you like to make make use of every avenue that is possible to make sure that you are you, you remain, remain above the threshold value right. So, you optimize the performance to the extent that you can. So, uh, <coughs> now also if you remember uh, in the differentiation in the in the FM demodulation process there is a differentiation that you effectively do at the demodulator right and that differentiation can enhance the noise. The, in fact, you use the noise power spectrum if you remember is a parabolic spectrum right. So, the noise so uh, the noise spectrum gets enhanced towards the uh, edges and you can make use of this theory to use a de-emphasis and pre-emphasis set of filters which will uh, optimize the performance right. So, uh, I will leave those details for self reading because of lack of time. So, we move on to now uh, a different set of uh, modulation schemes. So far all the modulation schemes that we discussed, we discussed basically three types of mod really two, two types of modulation schemes namely various kinds of amplitude modulation and various kinds of angle modulation or exponential modulation right. In all these modulation schemes that we discussed, the carrier was a sinusoidal signal, right. Now, we can have situations where we use non sinusoidal signals, and one of the important kinds of non sinusoidal sig signals which are used as carriers are pulses, right, where pulses are used to carry the messages of interest. Of course, we are still in the domain of analog modulation, and pulses are absolutely. Uh, basic to the transmission of digital information. I am not talking about digital transmission here or transmission of digital information here. I am still referring to transmission of analog information right continuous signal continuous in amplitude and continuous in time. Even for transmission of such signals sometimes we use pulse modulation pulses as carriers and when we do that we call the resulting modulation schemes as pulse modulation schemes. So, in uh, pulse modulation schemes, the first thing that we need to understand before we go into any pulse modulation scheme is the fact that uh, you know your, your as I said your carrier is this kind of a thing. Why should we do this? Hmm? That is one question that will come in your mind, why? Okay. Hmm? No, it really is application dependent. Reduced noise? Um, <coughs> not really, I mean, directly for that reason. Actually, let us look at it this way. There, suppose <coughs> you are, suppose you are measuring a lot of data somewhere, right. Um, maybe you are monitoring the conditions on the sea floor. Maybe you are monitoring the conditions uh, somewhere else or in some plant, right, remotely. So, you have a number of measurement devices, and these devices all have to um, pass on the information to some central station, right. So, there are two ways of doing it. You keep collect each of the sensors that you have, these monitoring devices that you have, 
it generates electrical information and modulates a suitable <coughs> carrier and carries out a frequency division multiplexing of all these information and transmits it to the central station, right. It is more convenient in such situations because you do not need really a large number of carriers, it, it becomes the equipment becomes unnecessarily complex there, right. It is much simpler and it, it so happens that most of the time uh, your measurement rate is not typically that high in many, many applications. It is quite okay if you measure the temperature at one time instant, then measure something else, maybe pressure, maybe something else and so on and so forth and then come back and measure the temperature again, right. In the meantime, the temperature would not have varied too much, right. So, what you are really doing is you are measuring each quantity, passing on the information and coming back to the same quantity again, right. You are, you are multiplexing a lot of information by transmitting each information in a small interval of time. So, during this pulse interval, let us say you measure the value of the parameter, it is maybe you modify its amplitude and transmit a pulse of a certain amplitude and after some time you come back to the same value, same parameter, you remeasure it, maybe the value has changed. So, you represent it by a different amplitude, pulse of a different amplitude and just transmit the amplitude again, right. And in, in between these two, you have work in time, you have time which is not occupied by this particular measurement, right. You could have a second set of pulses right measuring the second parameter and that parameter is transmitted in these slots right and so on and so forth. You have depending on how width is uh, how narrow is your pulse width that you can make and how much time interval you have between two pulses that is how frequently you have to transmit this information you can multiplex in time domain many such informations one after another, right. So, uh, during this time interval you are you let us say you are looking at information in channel 1, during this time interval you are inf looking at information in channel 2 and so on and so forth. Your channels are now different time slots, <coughs> right. So, basic <coughs> also to why is that it offers me a simple way of multiplexing multiple messages on the same transmission medium, right. So, it leads to time division <coughs> multiplexing. So, it provides me an alternative method of multiplexing information. One can also use frequency division multiplexing even in this context, but many situations in many situations in this kind of a thing is much easier and much more convenient to do than frequency division multiplexing. <laughs> So, that is the basic purpose. Implicit in this whole thing is the fact that even if you are let us say let us let us say you are looking at temperature, right. So, the temperature has a certain profile, right, as a function of time, right. These are all time axis. Temperature has a certain profile. So, it it is implicit that you, you will not be able to transmit this continuous information now, right. At best what you will be doing is you are looking at this temperature information in this time interval, then looking at it in this time interval and so on and so forth, right. So, now you may say that you are losing information, you are not really getting all the information that you want, right. The answer is correct. In general, yes, but I am sure you know the sampling theorem. If the sampling theorem condition is satisfied by this signal, right, and if you sample this parameter at a sufficiently fast rate, you will not lose any information. You can reconstruct this entire waveform by just knowledge of the samples at specific time instance, right. So, central to the theme of pulse modulation schemes is the sampling theorem which all of you know, right. What is the sampling theorem state? The sampling theorem states that if a signal, if a message MT has a spectrum M of F which is 
limited in bandwidth let us say to W hertz right. So, Sampton theorem is really for band limited signals the spectrum <coughs> is from minus W to plus W it has no spectral components above W. Then it is possible to reconstruct the continuous waveform MT from its samples taken at intervals of T s seconds or taken at a rate of F s samples per second right. If you if you just have the samples of this signal at a rate of F s samples per second where F s F sub s is greater than 2 w. If you choose the sampling rate to be greater than 2 w then it is possible to reconstruct M t from these samples. Right. And what is the reconstruction process? You have to pass the samples through an ideal low pass filter. Right. So, the operation is the low pass filter of bandwidth W. This is the summary of the sampling theorem. Uh, if you have forgotten it, quickly review it because the entire pulse modulation scheme, this set is based on this result sampling theorem result right. <coughs> so, the mathematical uh, description of the sample signal will be as follows. If I use impulse functions for sample to simplify you know, the, the simplest kind of sampling is if you were to if you this each of these pulses becomes an impulse right. Mathematically the uh, entire treatment is very simple in that case. So, the sample signal when you use impulses for sampling will be given by this these are the sample values m of n times T s delta T minus n T s. Right. So, the nth sample is associated with an impulse function located at time t equal to nts n going from minus infinity to plus infinity. So, this is called impulse sampling of course, it is not very practical the first kind of modulation that we discuss is called pulse amplitude modulation. So, as you see now everything else is the, um, the basic concepts are the same. You have a pulse strain which is your carrier okay. Instead of a sinusoidal signal of some frequency you have a pulse strain which is a carrier. So, do you want to carry out a modulation basically what does it mean you want to embed the information that you want to convey on this carrier right. Again how can you do that you can modify some parameter of the carrier in proportion to the information that you want to embed. So, you want to make either the amplitude proportional to the message signal at the various time instants. What are other parameters of a pulse? Hmm? Width, pulse width is another parameter right. You can make the width of the pulse proportional to the signal amplitude at that point. You can make the position of the pulse proportional to the uh, signal amplitude at that time right. These are the things you can vary, these are the three parameters which is very similar to the things that we do in sinusoidal carriers. Modify the amplitude gives you amplitude modulation. Modify the phase that is like shift you know. So, that is a, a, a like phase modulation is somewhat similar. Modify the width that is like changing the frequency of the carrier in some sense. In the I am just giving analogy it is not exactly the same thing ok. So, just like you have three parameters there with which you can play around you can also play around with these three parameters and come up with three different kinds of pulse modulation schemes. Pulse amplitude modulation being the simplest. Pulse amplitude modulation is essentially sampling right. So, the sample signal in this case is that is denoted by m sub c t, c denotes the carrier, carrier is a pulse strain here and that will be the same thing as this hmm. 
into instead of a impulse function you have a rectangular pulse function right of the kind that I drew here right. So um, this, this is a notation for a rectangular function instead of writing RECT sometimes you just use this notation to denote a rectangular function with some argument and the argument is T minus NTS plus half tau upon tau. So let me explain this notation. Pi T by tau is essentially this kind of a function. Right. This is a plot of pi t by tau right. and this function when it is shifted by this much. So basically you are taking these samples you know uh, you are shifting this pulse to a general time instant by NTS also this pulse is because of this tau by 2 implies that you are shifting it so you are flushing it at time 0. So the center of the pulse the first pulse is not 0 but it is tau by 2 and so on and so forth. Can I can you tell me how I can how I can get this kind of a signal from this kind of a signal? This is your impulse sample signal right. How can I get a uh, PM signal here? This is a PM signal as you can see the, the nth pulse which is a rectangular pulse located at time NTS has an amplitude proportional to the message value at that time instant right. So this is what we call a PM signal right. Now how can I obtain this signal from this signal? Basically you have, you have to go through a filter which converts this ample impulse into this rectangular pulse is not it that is what you have to do. So if I pass this signal uh, uh, pass this sam uh, impulse sam sample signal through a filter whose impulse response HT looks like this. Right? Then if I have M delta T here I will get M C T here right. So I can generate of course direct generation is much easier but mathematically this is a good model because this helps you to understand the nature of the PM signal right. So uh, I am sure when you did your sampling theorem you talked about impulse sampling, natural sampling and flat top sampling. What kind of sampling is PM? Flat top sampling right. PM is essentially kind of flat top sampling as you can see. You see that is what the definition is. You are having a flat top pulse <coughs> this is a pulse that you are transmitting whose amplitude is governed by the message value at that time instant right. What happens in natural sampling? This pulse is not flat top it amplitude varies in proportion to the variation of the message in that time interval right. But that is not what we call pulse amplitude modulation. Pulse amplitude modulation is basically flat top sampling right. Now if you do this kind of a sampling what happens to the recovery process? How will you demodulate? So the modulation process is really very simple. Modulation process is generating these pulses whose amplitudes are proportional to the message signal. Hmm? So, um, to do demodel, suppose you did okay. There are two issues. Suppose I really had impulse sampling. I know what is the process of recovery. The process of recovery is one of ideal low pass filtering, right? That is the process of recovery. That is all. What will what how will things change when I have this signal coming in rather rather than this signal coming in? Have I done some modification here? Yes. 
have multiplied the spectrum of this signal by the Fourier transform of this rectangular pulse, right. So, you will have to first modify have a receiver, a receiver filter which will have the inverse transfer function, right, which will cancel the effect of this pulse broadening that you carried out. The holding, pulse holding, you know, you have done a sample and hold kind of operation here, right. Of course, you are not holding till the next time instead, but uh, in next till the next pulse, but you have done some kind of broadening of the impulse to a finite width pulse, right, and that modifies the spectrum. How does it modify the spectrum? So, before I discuss demodulation, how uh, so, when I ask you what is the sp uh, how, how does MC omega differ from M delta omega, right? And answer is that there is a product of this with what is the full transform of this? Same function, right? Of course, uh, there will also be a phase function associated with this because it is not centered at. 0. So, e to the power some j theta f right which at the moment I am ignoring right there will be some phase function associated with that because of the phase shift uh, because of the time shift in the time domain. Uh, more specifically h of f actually will look like this mod of h of f. etc. And the phase function uh, I should take this as a reference will look something like this. You can verify that right. etcetera. Remove this line. This will be the nature of theta of f. Okay. So, the important point is this that the spectrum of the received signal <coughs> is not just the message spectrum that you are looking for in your it's, it, it is getting modified by this shape here right. Some kind of filtering is being done right by this filter h of h of t. So, you have to equalize for that so that it is uh, equivalent to uh, coming back to your impulse sampling. So, the recovery or demodulation will be as follows it will be actually a two step process in step 1 to pass the modulated signal through an equalization filter. transfer function uh, let us say e h of e f equal to 1 by h of f. So, uh, mind you this really will become unnecessary if your pulse width is very small is not it. Suppose if this pulse width is really very small then this main node will have very large width right and it will be more or less flat in the balance of the message signal right. So, in that case it will not be necessary because and that is in intuitively it makes sense because if the pulse is with it is very small you are back to more or less impulse sampling right. If the pulse width is large then this becomes important equalization becomes important right. So, unnecessary if tau is much less than Yes. And step 2 would be pass the resulting impulse sample signal through a low pass filter, through an ideal low pass filter. Okay. Any questions here?
So that is all there is to pulse amplitude modulation. Pulse amplitude modulation in summary is essentially um, flat top sampling, right. So just like you recover the signal, uh, signal for a flat top sampling case, you are doing the same thing here, nothing more than that. You In a flat top sampling case, you do require an equalizer uh, and followed by an ideal low pass filter. Of course, this requirement of ideal low pass filter can be a little stringent, right, because you do not, cannot physically realize ideal low pass filters. So typically this is handled by, how do you handle this situation? That the fact is that your, your low pass filters will not be really ideal. So in, in, in practice how will you handle the situation? Your sampling rate should be somewhat larger than 2 W, right. You remember what, because I have not gone into the details of the sampling theorem here. I am assuming that all of you know the reason why you require an ideal low pass filter, right. The ideal low pass filter comes because your sample signal has a replicated spectrum. The spectrum of the sample signal replicates at intervals of 1 by T s. It is a periodic spectrum and you when you want to reconstruct the continuous time signal back, you want to keep only the central portion of the spectrum, removing all the other repeated portion of the spectrum, which can only be done by ideal low pass filter. If however you make sure that the replicated components are well separated from the desired component, then you have a slightly better situation in terms of design of your low pass filter, right. Let me just recap for you if you are not recollecting. Suppose your message signal has this kind of a spectrum, right, then the sample signal has this kind of a spectrum. It goes up to infinity like that, extends up to infinity on both sides, right. So if you want to reconstruct this signal back, you have to pass it through a low pass filter. If you have sufficient gap between these, then you have a possibility that instead of working with an ideal low pass filter, you can work with a slightly non ideal filter, right. Basically that is what, so if the, the situation where you have difficulty in hand, uh, designing ideal low pass filters <coughs> is typically handled by making sure that the sampling rate is somewhat larger than 2 W because this, this is centered at F s. So this will be F s minus W, right. You do not want this point and this two, these two points to be close to each other. There should be a guard band, right. If you have a sufficient guard band, that guard band provides for designing more practical filters rather than an ideal low pass filter. That is one thing. The second thing is if you do not provide for guard band, a certain kind of distortion occurs which you call the aliasing distortion now because this lobe will now get merged with this main lobe and you will not be able to separate the two out. When you do a low pass filtering, some portion of the spectrum from the next lobe will also interfere with the main lobe and your resulting reconstructed signal would be a distorted version of the original signal and not what you have. But these are things that you already discussed in your sampling theorem, so I am not, not going into details of those. So that is as far as pulse amplitude modulation goes. Any questions on that? So we quickly come to, okay, we will stop here. Uh, we will discuss the other, other two kinds of modulations, pulse width and pulse position modulation next time. Thank you very much.